Anyways, the book of Nahum, all three chapters today. Uh, again, overviewing, not dealing with everything, but we're going to actually get a very good uh, overview of the book from these ch three chapters. Let's begin with a, a word of prayer, and then we'll go into the book of Nahum. Father, thank you so much for Jesus, for his death, burial, and resurrection, which provides for us salvation. Lord, we thank you that you sent him to die in our place because of our sin that we've committed. Lord, we pray that you would help us to trust in you alone. Lord, that we would not trust in ourselves in the day of judgment that is coming. Lord, that we would have an answer for how could we stand before you. I pray that you would help us to understand that you are coming, and you're coming to judge the wicked, even as we study from the book of Nahum today. Lord, work in our hearts. Help us to trust in you alone. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So Nahum is the second prophet sent to Nineveh with a message from God. The first is more well known, Jonah. We were there a few weeks ago. In the days of Jonah, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, repented and was spared the judgment of God. Now after Assyria has destroyed and taken captive the northern kingdom of Israel, they have grown even more wicked. Their crimes against God have multiplied, both by their continued idolatry, but also their treatment of Israel, and especially their rebellious pride. The message then of Nahum from God to Israel uh, to Nineveh is God's wrath has been declared. The book, with its three chapters, neatly divides into three sections, somewhat following the chapter divisions, but the first chapter proclaims the destruction of Nineveh and Assyria. The second describes the coming battle in the very streets of Nineveh as Babylon will conquer the city. And the third speaks of doom for those who have seen, who have sown the seeds of terror and violence, who will themselves be cruelly terrorized and violently destroyed. The mercy and grace of God is often considered a contradiction to his judgment within our minds and hearts. However, without the judgment of God, there would be at least no impetus, no need to seek his mercy and grace. Indeed, the Bible, as God reveals himself, often holds the merciful and gracious redemption of God in tension as the other side of the coin to his judgment. We will see that in the book today. The book of Nahum and the first chapter, and really the first, second verse here, the first being an introduction as he introduces himself and his call to go to Nineveh and an oracle. And in the second verse, we want to begin by seeing that God, who is merciful, who is gracious, unleashes his wrath upon his wicked enemies. God, in his mercy and grace, does judge and judges the wicked. He judges the wicked by unleashing his wrath upon his wicked enemies. Look at verse 2 with me, if you would. Chapter 1, verse 2 of the book of Nahum. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. This is not a popular subject. In the day of Nahum, even, it was not a popular subject, especially as some of his contemporaries were preaching the very same thing against Judah. The northern kingdom, having already been destroyed, now Judah, then at this time, was being told, you're going to be destroyed. It's very unpopular to speak and to preach of God's judgment, but it is what will happen. God 
holds on to and is ready to unleash his wrath. Even as Paul says, the wrath of God is revealed. We've exchanged God for creatures. We suppress the truth. I think some recent years have been such a good illustration of this. No matter where you fall upon the spectrum and decisions for vaccines or not for the recent pandemic, there was definitely a uh, emphasis on suppressing some truth, even now as they find more and more out about uh, some untruth that was just proclaimed and proclaimed by those in charge, having even congressional uh, meetings and uh, trials over the issue. And in a greater way, we suppress the truth. And for those who do, for those who are like Nineveh, who've unleashed their, un their wickedness, God holds ready to avenge, to unleash his wrath, his vengeance on his adversaries and take out his wrath on them. And this is part of God's mercy because in doing so, he saves the righteous. He saves those who are his. God knows how to preserve the righteous while judging the wicked. And part of God's message that should prompt us, should, should make us desire his mercy and grace even more, is there is judgment coming for the wicked. God who is merciful, who is gracious, does unleash his wrath on his wicked enemies. But notice, as we move down to the first part of the next verse, that he is slow to do this. God, merciful and gracious, is slow to unleash his wrath. Why has our world endured for nearly 6,000 plus years. Because God is slow to anger. Even to Nineveh, who has destroyed the northern kingdom, who has gone beyond even God's mandate to be a tool for disciplining them and for correcting them, God is slow to anger. Notice here in chapter 1, verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. That should sound familiar. It should sound like what God tells Moses there on the mount as he reveals himself to Moses. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. God is slow to anger. Why is Hamas still around? Because God is slow to anger. Why is, dare we say, even the United States, with our history of murdering the innocent, still around? It's because God is slow to anger. If God was not slow to anger, then the very first sin we committed, we would then be summarily executed and sent straight to hell. But in his wrath, in even his judgment, unleashing wrath and vengeance upon the wicked. Notice his mercy and his grace to be slow to do this. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. This is even Nahum writing and proclaiming against an enemy of God's people. An enemy of God, even and saying, even to such as those, God is slow to anger. And he is great in power. Because God is merciful, he's gracious, he is slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and so he's slow to unleash his wrath. Notice the, the second part of that verse, and then verses 6 and 8 we find that God 
merciful and gracious, unleashes an unstoppable wrath. If you ever read through the book of Revelation and considered that mankind, at least two occasions in mass, tries to, by force of arms, rebel and stop God. You find out it doesn't go well for man at all. God cannot be stopped. He unleashes his unstoppable wrath. Look at verse 3b with me, if you would. He will by no means clear the guilty. He's not just going to give you a pass. His way is in the whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. This description in the second half of verse 3 reminds me uh, of a a large destructive storm like a tornado or a hurricane. Have you ever tried to go out and stop one of those? It doesn't work so well. You end up getting spun around the, the cloud with the cow. You can't stop it. This is God. This is his power unleashed. And he will by no means clear the guilty. It's unstoppable. Look at verse 6. Well, let's continue through verse 4. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The the world and all who dwell in it. We often consider how powerful what we call natural disasters are and how how we can't even uh, stand against them. We retrofit our buildings to withstand earthquakes and they still fall. We build our buildings according to codes to be able to withstand the the winds of hurricanes. And they're still so damaged they have to be torn down and rebuilt. And when God comes, it's almost ten times worse. Could we even say hundreds to thousands times worse than just a plain natural disaster that everything shrivels up. The sea, the rivers, they dry up. The blooms wither. The mountains and hills quake, even to melt. The earth heaves before him, the world and all who dwell in it. And it asks a question here in verse 6, with such power displayed, such unstoppable force, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. With a description such as this that's so powerful that even hills seem to melt into puddles. Did you know rock will be destroyed if a fire is hot enough? Did you imagine seeing a hill melt like an ice cream cone into a puddle. The earth quaking at the very presence of God coming upon it. Everything drying up, withering. And then think you could stand against it. And so Nahum asks, who thinks they could really stand against this, against the anger of God? Sadly, many of us think we can. Many are going about and and doing many things. Things they think will please God. And when they come before him, Jesus will look at them and say, Depart from me, I never knew you. They won't even be able to stand with all their good works in front of God's wrath. Who can stand before his indignation? Look at verse 8. 
Look at the power, but with overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries. He will pursue his enemies into darkness. God, when he comes by his mercy and grace, he unleashes an unstoppable wrath. No one can stand against it. No one can stop it. Those who try and hide from it, he pursues. It will be so great that another passage records for us that people will run to the mountains and ask for them to fall on them. Instead of turning repentance to God, they would rather be crushed to death. God unleashes an unstoppable wrath. And this is his mercy and grace, bringing the sin and the deeds of the wicked back on them. Assyria was noted for her violence. Nineveh was known to be wicked and vile and to be violent. God says, I'm visiting it back upon you. The very thing you did will happen to you. In chapter 2, you get the destruction foretold of the city. And it's not pleasant, it's not pretty. Everything is destroyed. People die in the streets. And God says, where's your chariots now? Because God unleashes his wrath on those who are guilty. But there is a glimmer of hope here. And Look at verse 7 of chapter 1. The glimmer of hope is this. When all this goes on, whether the localized events there that caused the downfall of Nineveh and Assyria or God's final day of judgment, which this is also referencing, there's hope. Part of God's mercy and grace, even as he unleashes this judgment, is to provide a refuge for the righteous. A bunker of safety in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, it was, became a fad to, to have a shelter in your backyard where you could go if the nuclear bombs start falling between Russia and the U.S. Many schools still have a lot of the signage and are still built to certain standards to, to provide a modicum of, of protection in case of nuclear war breaking out. And as much as people hoped in their safeties, in the bunkers, they're nothing compared to the safety we have in the refuge of God. And God provides a refuge. Verse 7, the Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Do you notice the qualifier here? You want to get into safety? You have to be known by God. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble when, it, when the wrath is unleashed. But to get in requires a personal relationship. I think of Noah. God told Noah, I'm going to destroy the earth. Worldwide flood. And the next time you hear someone doubting them, ask why there is sea salt on Mount Everest that we get Himalayan sea salt from to flavor our food. God destroyed the earth. It was only those who trusted him and got in the ark that were saved. God is going to destroy the earth again, this time with fire, when his wrath is unleashed to its fullest. 
when it becomes unstoppable, when he doesn't hold it back any longer. The only way to be saved from such wrath, to, to have a refuge, to avoid it, is in God. The Lord, He's good. His goodness means that He is a stronghold in the day of trouble. He is a refuge. He knows those who take refuge in Him. God is merciful. God is gracious. He is a refuge for the righteous. God knows how to save the righteous at the same time while judging the wicked. God is merciful. God is gracious. He is a refuge for the righteous. James chapter 2 verse 10 tells us if we fail to be perfect according to the law, then we're guilty of all of it. We're guilty of one point, one piece. Maybe we've never killed someone, but we've lied. Maybe we've never actually committed adultery, but we've thought about it. We've desired someone in our heart, and so are guilty of the same sin. Or maybe, no, we've not killed someone, but we've been angry with them without cause. Even a brother, and are guilty of their death as well. If we fail to be perfect, we're guilty of the whole law. If we are guilty of sin of, a, of the law, then we are enemies of God. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11 tells us we are God's enemies. And so we face the wrath of God. What Nahum here writes of Assyria applies to us. Except for that last part, if we but find refuge in God, if we are known by Him and take refuge in Him, then we get to enter into the stronghold in the day of trouble. We don't have to be the enemies of God. We can find refuge from sin and God's wrath in God alone through the redemption that is provided by Jesus alone. All of us have gone astray. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. All of us face the wrath of God. But for this reason, Jesus came, was sent by God in John chapter 3, verse 16, that who would ever believe on him would not perish, but have life eternal. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, He will hear us. He will redeem us. If we confess that we are sinners, if we come to Him and cry out, Forgive me! John writes in his letter that He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You want to take refuge, all you have to do is ask. Ask and trust. Ask for forgiveness. Trust that He forgives alone. So ask yourself do you think you could stand against God? Against the wrath that's coming? Do you think you could stand in front of God and hold Him back? Can you stand against God? Maybe you don't need to. Are you God's? Do you find refuge in Him? Or are you His enemy? Those He knows, they find refuge in Him. Are you known by Him?
The Bible over and over again presents it as a binary choice. There's only one of two options. Trust and be redeemed or reject and be condemned. So we implore you today because God's wrath is revealed. The very wrath that Nahum goes through here and describes that's coming to fall upon Nineveh is coming to fall upon the entire world. It's revealed. Won't you take refuge in Jesus alone? He came to seek and to save that which is lost, you and I. He came to pay for the very reason we're guilty and to make us clean. To no longer call us sinner, but friend. To no longer call us disciples, but friend. Do you take refuge? The wrath of God is revealed. If you haven't looked around lately, it's starting. Wars and rumors of wars. Sickness. Disease. Pestilence. Famine. Wicked rulers. The wrath of God is revealed. It's unstoppable. Will it take refuge in God? Or will you face his wrath? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today, for this short book. Lord, I pray for all who have heard your word that they would turn and trust you alone. Your wrath is evident. It's coming. Only because you hold it back in our our long-suffering and patient is not unleashed yet to its fullest extent. Lord, we pray that you work in our hearts, that we would trust you alone. Lord, for any who have heard your word, that they would trust for salvation in Jesus alone. Lord, even for those of us who have trusted in you, Lord, that we would wait patiently, knowing that you do not wish any should perish, but all should come to salvation, to repentance. Lord, help us to be busy about your calling to go into the world and to proclaim the good news that Jesus has died and risen again has paid for sins. Lord, that we would be messengers until the day your wrath is revealed. Lord, I pray that you work in hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen.